That brings us to the third section of the book of Hebrews, which is the last few chapters, chapters 11 through 13, and this is going to speak to us about a better principle. And it has to do with the issue of faith, the issue of faith. That's what he's going to focus on in chapters 11 uh, and 12 and 13. These three chapters are going to really drive home to us, really, what does it look like to be people of faith? Now, just in your notes there, you'll see it's kind of outlined for you how the chapter unfolds. He's going to begin, and you're very familiar with it, and I think in somewhat overly familiar with it that you might even really miss what Hebrews 11 is all about. But in Hebrews chapter 11, he gives us all these examples of faith. It starts with Abel. It includes Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Moses, his parents as well. And then they, these are people we know, people we have learned of and we've followed through all the Bible, Old Testament going forward. Now, I don't know if you've ever looked at the list in Hebrews chapter 11, these examples, but I'd like to have you think for just a second about something. There is somebody missing in that list. Somebody that you might think, I never thought of the fact that they're not in the list. Now, they really are reconciled to God. They are forgiven, and, but yet they're not in Hebrews chapter 11. After he shows us in the first three verses what faith is and what it looks like, in verse 4, he begins with the first person whose name is Abel. Now, who is Abel's mom and dad? Adam and Eve. So Adam and Eve are not mentioned anywhere in Hebrews chapter 11, and there's a reason for that. Adam and Eve are those who didn't live by faith. They lived by sight. They walked with God. They talked with God. They looked him in the face, face to face. But once sin entered, everybody from Abel going forward, counting every one of us as believers here today, have been on this side of the garden. And on this side of the garden, the only way that we as God's people can live is by faith. We don't get to see him with our physical eyes. We don't get to hear him with our ears. We don't reach out and touch him we have to live by faith. And so this chapter unfolds here what the people of God really look like, what it means for them to live like everybody from Abel going forward have actually lived. Well, after in chapter 11, he's trying to help us see the better principle of living by faith and what that looks like. He moves from the examples to the second thing where he talks in chapter 12 about the need to endure because if you can't see God, you can't touch him. There are times when you struggle. There are times when you feel like, how am I going to keep doing this? Where is he? And so this chapter helps us understand what it means to endure by faith, the endurance, the pressing on, the persevering. And in fact, he wants us to understand just because disciplines come into your life and God disciplines you, that's no indication that he's against you. It's an indication that he's for you. You are a child of his. And he's helping to make you more like his son and to help you to learn to know what it means to endure and just keep pressing on. And then after that chapter, he moves us into a third point here, and that is an exhortation, this final and fifth warning in the book of Hebrews. Remember, there are five warnings in the midst of this book of Hebrews, which is really originally a sermon to these people that was preached, and like every good sermon, as you get to going, you get to a moment to where you need to exhort and challenge people about what you've been saying. And so in this section here in chapter 12, we get that final and fifth warning, and it has to do with disobeying this word you've been hearing about all the way from chapter 1 going forward. Don't, don't, don't disobey. Don't, don't have faith. Hold to him. Endure with him. Be like those who have gone before you. Don't disobey this and walk away from this. And then finally, he gives us in chapter 13 some evidences of faith. In other words, what does it really look like if you live like Abel and everybody since then? What does it really look like if you endure by faith and you don't walk away and disobey what you've heard, but you keep clinging to Christ, keep holding on? What does it look like? What are those evidences like? Well, chapter 13, he's going to show us how it looks like it in our love for one another. He's going to show us in that chapter that one of the evidences of our faith shows up in how we handle marriage. Amazing, isn't it? that you get to really draw conclusions about God and Christ and marriage from the people of faith. He also shows us in that chapter to relate to the temporal and material blessing that God has given to us in our life. People of faith treat stuff in this world different than people of non-faith. 
He also helps us to understand here how our relationship to our pastors and our elders, those who lead you, how God has placed them over you and how your faith shows up in your really submitting to them and them caring for your soul. And he goes on and on in chapter 13. It's all to drive home that really this section that we're coming into is going to focus on faith over and over again, turning, as it were, the facets of faith from one direction to another so that by the time he gets done, you get the idea of what it really means to say Jesus is a better person. Jesus is a better priest, and there's a better way to live life than the world knows. It's called faith, and we live that way. Now, to get us started there, I want to read just a few of the verses here in our text and I know we're preparing through this text to come to the communion table, but uh, let's, let's read these few verses here. I just want to highlight some and then uh, make a few thoughts and comments about it. Chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the men of old gained approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. And as you can note in your notes there, you'll see this is really him beginning to give us some of the features of faith or defining faith for us, helping us to see what it looks like in the first three verses. But from verse 4 to verse 40, you're going to read this phrase over and over again. By faith, Abel, verse 4, by faith. Verse 5, by faith, Enoch. By, verse 7, by faith, Noah. Verse 8, by faith, Abraham. Verse 11, by faith, even Sarah. And on and on through the chapter, he is going to show us here what it looks like for us to really see these, what we were going to call the family of faith. Those who've gone before us, those who line the way, as it were, on this journey that we are on. This is not only what faith looks like, verses 1 to 3, but if you want to see what the family looks like, if you want to see how it is displayed and put out for everybody to look at and observe in their lives and in your lives, here are the people, verses 4 through 40. And this chapter that we've just looked, read real quickly is so familiar to us. There's so many names that we have called it. We have often referred to it as the Saints Hall of Fame, the Heroes of Faith, the Honor Roll of the Old Testament Saints, the Westminster Abbey of Scripture, or the Faith Chapter. All of those would be good, and I would think that they're rightly understood, makes sense to us. But here's the danger. In fact, there's two things I want to kind of just present to you before we jump right into verses 1 through 3 this morning, which will not be complicated and hard for us to understand. There's a couple of things I think I need to kind of set before you so that we look at these verses and understand them the way they are intended to be looked at. Let's first of all think all about the connection. you got to ask this question when you come to Hebrews chapter 11. How does chapter 11 relate to chapter 10 and chapter 12? Now, I know there's a couple of you in this room who are going to say, Kevin, it relates that way because 11 comes after 10 and right before 12. <laughs> right? 10, then you go to 11, then you go to 12. But I tell you what, it's to me quite remarkable when you think about it that one of the most basic Christian realities we are called to live by faith is often misunderstood and misrepresented, especially as we come to Hebrews chapter 11. We don't see the connection between the two here. When you think of faith here, you need to be thinking that faith is one of those most important and repeated things in the Bible. In fact, there are at least 240 times in the New Testament where God talks to us about faith. Now, if God tells us something 240 times, what does that mean? He's serious about us understanding it and getting it. In fact, in the chapter Hebrews 11 that we're looking at, it's used 24 times alone just in that chapter. In fact, you could think of it like this. That term faith is one of those designated titles for Christians, right? I mean, sometimes in the Bible, like in the book of Luke, we are referred to as followers of the way. But that's not the only term that the Bible uses to define and distinguish us as people of God. In Acts chapter 2, verse 44, those who are Followers of the way are called believers. They're called believers. Now think about that for just a second. We're being defined as people who believe. That's what we are. We are people who have faith. We are people who exercise faith. We are those who are of faith. And so the writer of Hebrews is going to dive into this in this chapter because it's such a definable and distinguishable thing. 
But the connection of what he wants us to understand about Hebrews 11 is so important to what we have seen in the last part of chapter 10 and then going into chapter 12. You see, he wants us to make sure that when we think about this distinguishing mark of our lives as believers, of being people of faith, living by faith, exercising faith, having faith, that we understand how that fits in to this flow of what he's been saying to us. So right there in your Bible, why don't you go back and turn to chapter 10, and I just want to read for you verses 36 to 39. In fact, let me just jump up to verse 32, because this is where we ended, and this is that warning passage that we were looking at in verse 32. He says, Remember the former days when after being enlightened you endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you yourselves uh, have a better possession and a lasting one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For yet in a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the persevering of the soul. Now remember in that section when we were in it a few weeks ago, we saw that there was this chilling warning in that section right before what we read where he talks about people who are apostates, who willfully, deliberately, having heard about the gospel, having been around the gospel, even having experienced some of the things related to the gospel, make up their mind, I am not going to believe in this Jesus anymore. I am done. I am walking away from Christ. I am walking away from the church. I am finished with that Jesus. I don't want him in my life. So when they walk away, it shocks us and makes us think, why did they do that? What about me? Could that happen to me? And so at the end of chapter 10, he is encouraging them and saying, no, that is not what I'm thinking of you. These marks of grace, these evidences that you're a believer in those verses that we just read are in your life. That's why he ends in chapter 10, uh, verse 39, by saying, you're not of those. We are not of those who draw back or shrink back to destruction. We're not going to walk away from Christ. That's not who we are as God's people. So in that section, the word I want you to notice, I think of connecting what he did in chapter 10 and what he's going to do in chapter 12 and what's in the middle here, chapter 11, is that phrase, endurance. What you have need of is endurance. That's what you want to keep doing. Just keep pressing on. That's evidence and proof of your salvation, the evidence and proof of grace in your life. So he does that in chapter 10. Now go over to chapter 12 and notice what he says in chapter 12, verse 1. He says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, he's talking about those in chapter 11, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with, there it is again, endurance, the race that is set before us. So what is the link here? In between chapter 10 and chapter 12, Hebrews 11 serves these chapters, I should say, serve like a bookend to Hebrews chapter 11. He is saying to them, listen, I know you are those who are the real thing. You are persevering. You're pressing on in the faith. You're not walking away from Christ. It is hard. You're losing possessions. You are being persecuted. All those things are true. But I want you to know I see God's grace in you, and you are the ones who are going to press on and persevere. And I want you to know in the middle of that what it looks like when people do that. Hebrews chapter 11. And so Hebrews chapter 11 becomes, as it were, this way for them to sit down for just a moment and think through the men and the women of faith. And in real life, in real difficult circumstances, they really display what faith in God really looks like, what it means to be a follower of Him. And I want you to note something just as you're kind of just looking over all at the connection between chapter 10 and chapter 12 and how in the middle is the illustrations and the encouragement of what it looks like. In this chapter, there are plenty of examples of those who lived by faith who had triumph upon triumph, right? Think about that. Those are, there are people in this chapter here who can say like, like Noah that 
he built an ark and God spared him when the floods came. That's pretty triumphant. You have the children of Israel marching around the wall of Jericho, just quietly marching around. And then when they shout, walls fall into the ground. That's pretty triumphant. You have a 100-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman, Abraham and Sarah, who are beyond the ability in themselves to have a child, and they have a baby, Isaac. And on and on the stories go of triumph upon triumph. But I want you to notice something in this chapter down in verse 36. But others. But others experienced mocking and scourgings. Yes, also chains and imprisonments. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated. And on and on he begins to describe them. And listen, I want you to hear something. Men and women of faith are not just those who have a triumphant experience in following the Lord, but sometimes they have tragedy upon tragedy. It's not an indication that they're not walking with the Lord. It's not an indication that they're not really pleasing to them. These people from verse 36 on are people who are just as pleasing as Abraham and Sarah, just as pleasing as Noah, just as pleasing as anybody listed in the verses before them. And this is a very important thing. He wants you to know, endure. Keep pressing on. Don't turn around. Don't leave him. Keep clinging to Christ. That's who you are. That's what I see in you. And you need to know that there are moments of triumph and victory and, and shouting and excitement. But you just need to know there are times when life really gets bad and life gets hard. And that's just as much the people of faith as anybody else. And what are you saying? Is I want you to see between this chapter that tells you to endure, that's what you need, and to keep looking to Jesus, chapter 1, and endure in doing that, right in the middle, let's get a real picture of what it looks like to be these kind of people. That's the connection. All right, now, that leads me to a second question, or a second thing I think I want to say before I look at the verses. And that is, what do we talk about? What are we talking about when we say we have faith? We're the people of God, and we have faith, and what does that look like? You're telling me that we need to endure. That's what we're going to endure. And uh, he, he exhorts us at the end of chapter 10, telling us that's what we need. He shows us in chapter 12 what it means to keep looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, and running that race. Um, and chapter 11 is all about examples of this faith. What does that really mean? And this is where I find that we often misunderstand Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 often becomes one of those passages, and we as preachers love to do stuff like this, right? Is just kind of jerk it out of the, of the book and do a whole series on living by faith. But you really don't understand what it means to live by faith and how it applies to our life if you don't understand what's gone before and what's coming after. It's really a travesty to write a book on faith just talking about one chapter here and not the rest. It is really wrong and it is really mishandling of the scripture to just really talk about all these wonderful things about faith and illustrating it however we want to illustrate it without seeing how it connects with that. And when we do that, here is what we do. We come up with what I like to call some misconceptions about faith. You won't have time to write them down. Uh, I can send them to you if you want. But I just thought this morning as I was sitting in my office, I'm just going to bullet out some of the things that I hear people say sometimes faith is, Right? And it goes like this. Faith is not trusting in something for which there are no facts. People will say, well, you know, you just can't prove this Jesus thing. You just can't prove the Bible. You can't really have any evidence that really, you just kind of like are believing something for which there are really no facts. That is not true faith. True faith does have facts. It's verifiable. It's reliable. It's something that we can look at and we say, oh, we understand what God's Word is saying and we believe that. So faith is not trusting in something for which there are no facts. Here's another one. Faith is not putting your trust in something or someone about whom you know nothing. I mean, just have this conversation sometime with somebody about uh, believing on Jesus as their Savior. Start asking him who he is, why he's their Savior. And they go, I don't know. I mean, I just know that somebody told me he was a sinner and I, I, I believe that, I guess. I don't know what that really means that Jesus lived and died, and I'm not really sure what that means, uh, but I asked him to come into my heart, and I'm not even sure what that means. That's not real faith. Real faith is not putting your trust in something or someone about whom you know nothing. Another thing you could say is this. Faith is not a blind leap into the dark. That's not what faith is. 
fourth thing you could say is faith is not the antithesis of true scientific endeavor. In other words, faith is not just saying, well, you know what, faith and science, that's two separate things. Science, true science, not pseudoscience, real science and biblical faith are not enemies. When we understand rightly science as it should be understood, we will find the Bible saying those same things. Now, science doesn't make the Bible true, but science discovers what the Bible has already said is true. So faith is not an antithesis to true science. You can put another thing down, or at least think about it here. Faith is not superstition. It's some kind of made-up idea. If I do this, this will happen. Another thing I put down is faith is not a positive mental attitude. That one comes out a lot of times with people, right? I got this positive attitude. I got faith. Well, you just could have a positive attitude. <laughs> uh, do I believe that people of faith should be the most positive people in the world? Yes, but you can miss real faith and have a positive attitude. Another thing you can think of here is faith is not wishful thinking. <laughs> faith is not saying, well, I just, I just wish this would happen. I hope God would do something like this for me. That's not biblical faith. Another one is, Faith is not a creative power that brings into existence things that, are other, that otherwise wouldn't exist. Well, that's pretty common in the name it, claim it crowd. Well, I'm just going to believe God's going to give me this. Well, why are you going to believe that? Because I just have confidence he's going to do it. Well, I, I wish I had that kind of faith. I mean, I would have a lot more stuff <laughs> in my life if that really worked that way, right? But faith is not some kind of creative power that brings into existence things that otherwise wouldn't exist. And that leads me to my last and final one, Faith is not the pressure we put on God to get him to do things for us that he otherwise wouldn't do. I mean, somehow or another, faith gets in our mind and teachers and preachers and books and all those things kind of make us get this idea. If enough of us will really get enough faith and we can gang up on God, we can get his arm behind his back and he'll say, okay, I give, I'll do it, I'll do it. And we force him to do something he wasn't going to do. But our faith made him do it. That's not that is not what Hebrews 11 is about at all. And yet, when we disconnect chapter 10 from chapter 12, those kind of things are what come up. So let's dive in and let's look at, first of all, the first three verses this morning. It will prepare us for communion. It will get us ready for the next week when we come back and we look at verse 4, headed on into verse 40 about the family of faith and what it looks like to see it on display. But what we need to do right now is, first of all, look at the features of faith and how it is described in verses 1 through 3. Now, when you read Hebrews 11, verse 1, now faith is, the, the knee-jerk reaction, the, the, the simple way of thinking of that is, that must be a definition. He's just defining for us what faith is is in a sense of a definition. But let me just kind of unpack a little thought with you here to make sure you understand here what he is talking about. I think it's more of a description in verses 1 through 3 than it really is a solid factual definition. I'll show you what I mean. So here are some ways you could define something. There are three of them, right? You could define something objectively, and that is you would be talking about what something looked like. Let me illustrate it this way. Let's say I had a bicycle. We all know what a bicycle is, right? I know it's been a long time. But <laughs> you, you know what a bicycle is, right? So if I was to define something objectively like a bicycle and show you what it looks like, I would say something like this. A bicycle is a compound for the word by for two and cycle for wheels. It's two wheels. I'm just describing it and defining it objectively. The wheels are made of rubber, spokes for reinforcement, and metal. They're attached to a metal frame, and on top of the frame is a seat that you sit on. The handlebars are objects to hold on as you ride the bicycle and guide it. All that would be would be defining it somewhat factually, objectively, right? But now I could also describe that bicycle subjectively in the sense that it is telling you what it feels like. If I were to say, listen, if you'll sit on this bike and ride off on that bike, you're going to encounter a wonderful experience. The wind is going to blow in your hair. You're going to be able to see vistas and views you hadn't seen before just sitting at the house. This will get you out there and cause you to experience, as it were, a front row seat of just really all this stuff that you're going to see as you take a ride. Now, it's the same bike, but we've moved from an objective, factual description of what it looks like to something of describing it subjectively and what it feels like to get on that bike. Now, I know some of you are taking this by faith because it's been so long since you've been on a bicycle. I get that. But you understand what I'm saying here when we talk about defining something or describing something subjectively and what it feels like. 
The third thing you could do is you could describe that same bike functionally, and that would help you understand how it acts, what it acts like, or how it operates, if you like, how it operates. So if I say, if you'll sit on this seat, put one foot on the pedal, and then push ahead, place your other foot on the other pedal, and balance yourself as you begin to pump the pedals, balancing yourself as you ride along, you're going to experience here and see how this thing functions. So what is Hebrews 11? Well, to me, Hebrews 11 is not a factual definition. It's more of a functional description. He is saying to us, listen, if you really grasp what's going on in verses 1 through 3, you see what the function of riding, let's use the analogy, the bicycle of faith. I'm not just describing faith objectively. I'm not just telling you what it feels like, though there are feelings that go with living by faith. I get that. But what I want you to really see here, the writer is saying, I want you to see how it functions. When you come to Abel, there's something about Abel's life that shows you how faith functions in our life. When you come to Noah, there's something about his life that shows you how faith really functions. And right on down through all of them, he's going to do that. Does that make sense to you? All right, so then if, if we're going to look at this as a not a factual definition, but really the function of it, what it looks like, let's jump right into it and let's see the four features of faith here that he talks about in verses 1 through 3. All right, first of all here, he says faith is, I'm just going to give you the function of it. This is how it functions. I'm describing it for you. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. And I, and I put in my Bible, in my notes, right beside that verse, this is the attitude of faith. This is the attitude of faith. In other words, what he is saying here, faith has this attitude of assurance and confidence of things that are hoped for. In other words, I don't have some of these things literally in my hand, but I know that those promises, what God has given and what God has put before us in his word, I have the assurance that they are really mine. The word assurance here is an interesting word here. It could, be, it could be translated in some of your translations, substance, substance, the substance of things hoped for. And you get the idea. It's like it's really here, though I really don't have it, right? It's substance. And so when we think about the substance of things hoped for here, he is describing for us here that faith takes things that God has said and God has promised and treats them like I've got them right now. That's why, by the way, brothers and sisters, you can't use faith as a way to come up with something you want to have and just say, I'm going to trust God for that. People who do that live a very disappointed Christian life because they're trying to create promises and things that God never said he would do. And when it doesn't happen, they wonder what happened. Why didn't God do that? I believed it. I trusted it. No, faith takes those things it hopes for, those promises, those truths that are revealed, and it treats it with an attitude of assurance and confidence. And that's what it's talking about here. So things that are hoped for here are things, for example, let's just do an example that you know from everyday life. I could use this illustration. Sometimes when it's midwinter and you start thinking about summer, you have in your mind the, the sense of a, an attitude of experiencing and bringing something of the vacation right into December. You get on your phone, you get on your computer, and you start looking at something that's ahead that you really are not there yet, and you take that as it were. This is just an illustration. You take that as it were, and you start thinking about and living in the good of the fact that that summer vacation is going to be like this. And that's just an earthly example of that as well, right? Christmas in October is the same thing, right? You, in October, you start thinking about Christmas. Now, Christmas isn't here yet. Gifts are not here yet. But as it were, you have a sense of a hope for that good thing to be in your life. And so you live in the good of it, and you treat it with an attitude of assurance like that's coming. Now, that's not going to necessarily happen with Christmas or vacations, but when we come to the Bible and we start thinking about God's word and what he has promised, we should take those things that we don't fully, completely have and live in the assurance and attitude of, they are true right now for me. Now, now, what are some of those things that we could maybe put in that list of things? Well, we could put in that list of things the fact that we are forgiven, right? 
How many of you, when you realized that you were a sinner, that you were under the just punishment and wrath of God for your sin, you deserved him to condemn you and send you to hell, how many of you ever heard him audibly say to you, you are forgiven? You never heard that. You, you never saw him write something up in the cloud that said, your name, you are forgiven. Count on it. Never, ever. You took what he said, what he promised in his word, that whosoever believes on Christ will be saved. Who, If you repent, if you trust Christ, your sins will be forgiven. We are justified by faith through grace. That not of ourselves. It's God's gift. And so when we think about this first attitude of faith, it is that attitude that says something like this. You know, I didn't hear that. I didn't see that. But I really took what he said and I believed it right now. Does that make sense to you? The same is true with the second coming of Christ, right? None of us have ever, ever seen Christ come back because he hasn't come back. But he's promised that when he comes back, he is going to bring a salvation full and free and complete for all of his people, every aspect of sin that's affected the world and our bodies and our lives and everything. It's all going to completely be gone. We're going to enter into glory. That's why it's called glorification. And when we do, that will be heaven on earth forever and ever and ever, and sin will never enter again, and our bodies and our world will never face any of the trials and challenges of, of this life. And yet none of us have ever experienced any of that but we take that thing that we hope for and we have the assurance right now that's mine that's mine that's the first feature of faith that's what faith does it takes the attitude and it believes that let me tell you, ask you a question just, a, just an illustration how different would you act all of you just on a human level if I told you today that when you leave church you can go home and you can check your bank account and I'll put a million dollars in everybody's account today. <laughs> now you haven't seen it, right? And you count on the fact that I'm truthful and trustworthy and I got the resources, right? But what would that do to you? I tell you what you would do. You would kind of walk out of this place whistling. You'd be going, man, all those bills I got to pay, gone. All those worries about my future and my finances and what in the world was going to happen in the future if I'd be able to make it, gone. You would take that which you hoped for and which was promised to you and you would have an attitude of assurance. That's really mine. That's just a human faltering illustration. God is not a God who's going to promise you something in his word that's not true. That he doesn't have the resources to fulfill. And as you go through this and you see how Abel and Noah and Abraham, the children of Israel, said, you know what? God said those walls are going to fall over there. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to march around that city. Because he promised that. You can't again, I want to make this clear to you, you can't create your own promises. God's going to give me a Mercedes Benz. I'm tired of driving this little Volkswagen. I'm going to get a Mercedes Benz. So I've got faith. That is not what you can do. You may be one disappointed person. Volkswagen may break down, right? You may be riding a bicycle and walking somewhere. You cannot create what you want by faith. But you can take what God promises, and it's the assurance here. All right, I need to move it on for you. Okay, let's wrap it up here and get these last three. He then goes on and says, faith is the conviction of things not seen. This is the actions of faith. Now, this goes deeper, right? So people of faith have an attitude. If God said that in his word and it's true, I want to believe that because it's true. He can't lie to me. He forgives me. He promises. He's going to give me grace. He's going to sustain me. He's going to provide for me. He's coming again. All those promises, my attitude is like those are real. Those are mine right now. And you know what that then does? It leads to the second thing, the conviction of things not seen. This is the actions of faith. And in this chapter, here's what you get. A picture of these people who had an attitude. If God said something, then that's true. I believe it. I count on it. And therefore, my life is going to show how I behave that I really believe that. I mean, take Noah. I love Noah's story here. And we'll unpack it in a couple of weeks. God comes to Noah and says it's going to rain. That doesn't freak you out, right? Because you've seen rain. But Noah has never seen rain. And God comes to him and says, it's going to rain, it's going to flood. And I just kind of picture Noah going, rain? That would be like God saying to you, I need to tell you something. It's going to gleep for 40 days. And some of you are scratching your head going, what's, what's gleep? I don't know. It's just a made-up word, right? <laughs> 
Rain was a new word for Adam. He had never heard it. And if I came to you and I said, it's going to gleep for 40 days, and what I want you to do is go build a boat because when that gleep starts, it's going to become bad. Now, how would I know that you really believe that what I said, you took that as your attitude? Well, you'd be like Noah and you'd go build a boat. That's what Noah did. He'd never seen rain. He's nowhere near rain. There's no, no oceans around him. And God is calling him to build a boat. If you've ever had the chance to go to the ark encounter and get the impression of what that really looks like and see just the magnificence and the magnitude of that thing, and it's 120 years of doing this, then you understand that faith is the kind of thing when God says something in his word, you have an attitude that believes that, and you start saying, I'm going to start living that way. Let me just apply it to salvation for us. So if I believe that the scripture teaches, and it does, that whoever repents and believes their sins, that they'll be forgiven. Christ will become their righteousness. God will accept them fully and completely based on what Christ has done, not me. If I have that attitude, I go, I didn't see Jesus die on the cross. I, didn't, I wasn't around there when that happened, but I believe that as a sinner, if I believe that my actions are going to show up like this, I'm going to stop, stop trying to add things to the work of Christ. I'm going to stop trying to say, well, I know Jesus died, but I, if, but I better work on this so that he'll really keep loving me and keep forgiving me and keep me his child. That's not faith if you think like that. Faith gives up on everything. Do we struggle sometimes thinking we need to add something? Yes, because we're so sinful. Our hearts are so wicked. We're so wanting to smuggle our character back into God's presence, say, look at me, look at me. That'll be the Cain and Abel as we get to that point and we study that. But the fact of the matter is people of faith go, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. It's not me. It's not anything I do. It's not Jesus plus me. It's Jesus alone. And I'm going to take that which God has said about salvation and forgiveness, and I'm going to quit trying to add something in my mind or in my life to think that that helps me somehow be saved, keep saved, or loved by God. So faith moves, not just from an attitude. God said that, and I really believe that too. Now it's going to govern the way I live my life. Does, does that make sense to you? Okay, faith has an attitude, leads to actions. You know, I, I, give, me, give me a two-minute sidebar here for you, okay? Because I was thinking this morning of one of the best biblical illustrations of what I mean by living by faith in this way, not only having an attitude but your actions is the story of uh, Elijah in 2 Kings chapter 5. The Arameans there are plotting to capture the prophet Elisha and kill him, I should say, Elisha. And the king sends this great army during the night to surround the city where Elisha is staying. Remember the story there in Kings? And the Bible tells us that the next morning, Elisha, the assistant, got up early, probably, I think, to go make some coffee. I'm sure it was Starbucks or something like that. And he went outside to get some water, and the next text says, behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city. And the assistant runs aside, wakes Elisha up and says, alas, my master, what shall we do? Elisha goes outside with him, surveys the scene, and then makes this rather amazing statement to the associate. He says, do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, can you imagine? I can just see that assistant saying, Elisha, you might be a really good prophet, but you're a lousy mathematician. Where are all those with us? If my math, he would say, serves me right, there's one you and one me, and that makes two, and there is an army of at least a 1,000 trained warriors around us. You got your walking stick. I guess I can throw some rocks. That's what we're going to do. That's, that's what you mean. Elisha simply prays in verse 17 of that chapter and says, O oh Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw. The mountains were full of horses and chariots of fire. An Old Testament illustration of how Elisha not only believed that God was going to protect him, but actually acted on it. And that's what I mean by the promises. In there. All right, two more. Next thing is, he says, faith is... Not only the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Then he says in verse 2, For by it, that is by faith, all the men of old gained approval. And that simply just means this. Faith brings with it a sense of assurance that God is pleased. There's an approval from God. God is, it, call this God's Grammy, if you will, God's high five, good job. 
It's just what comes along with the people of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. There's an assurance in a sense of which they know God is pleased. Without faith, it goes on to say in the chapter, it's impossible to please him. But I guarantee you, if you are the people who believe what God's word says, let it govern your life and you act upon it, you are the ones that God is looking at going, well done, good job. That's what pleases me. It doesn't please me when you see your sin and you try to say, well, I'm going to straighten my life up so God will forgive me. I'm going to work hard at being a better person so I can go to heaven. God is not pleased with that. Ask Cain. He'll tell you God is not pleased with that. But the person of faith who does what those of faith do gets the approval of God. Last one. And by faith we understand that the worlds were made. Look at what he says in that verse. They were made not out of things which are seen, but out of things which are not seen. God didn't get some visible stuff and say, oh, I'm going to make a world from that. God took nothing and made it. And listen to this. That's the biggest and first step of our faith, isn't it? It's an example here of accepting something that we didn't see, that we weren't around. And I love to have this conversation with people who are evolutionists or people who are theistic evolutionists who really in the end have to admit, well, I just believe that based on some things because I wasn't there either. None of us were there. And so the biggest faith step we take is in the beginning when we open Genesis 1 and we read, in the beginning, God created. You weren't there. I wasn't there. But design implies a designer, and so I believe by faith that if something is right here visibly before me, this world, I have to attach that to someone who made it. And the Bible gives us the reasons for believing why God is the one who made it. So there is this acceptance and assurance that comes with that, and something that we really lay hold of and we really believe. It's really a logical faith system. It's not illogical. I think people who don't believe in the creative uh, work of God in making the world by what's called divine fiat, that he makes something ex nihilio out of nothing, really are the people who get it right. And the rest of them are just somewhat insane for thinking otherwise. You say, why would you call them insane? Well, let me just close with this example here. Let's say all of us who live in this county know that there's a building supply downtown called Reeves Building Supply. And down there in Reed's building supply, there are shingles, there's two-by-fours, there's sheetrock, there's paint, there's nail. Are you telling me that one day if a big explosion takes place down there at Reeves and the smoke clears out, that the possibility is that there'll be a half a million dollar house sitting there? You would be insane to think something like that. But that's exactly what we really have to believe if we don't believe that a designer and a creator made the stuff that we can see. A house implies a builder, a designer. Or take that piano. I just thought about this. I was standing out there a while ago. That piano there. Let's just say one day a native in Africa is sitting on the back of an elephant. And they're running through the jungle and there's this massive crash into this this big tree. And once the explosion takes place and once all that crash is settled, you look over there and there stands a a Steinway piano. I mean, you've got the ivory, right? (laughs) You've got the harp, the strings, and the tree, the wood. Would you really believe something like that? You know, that doesn't make logical sense. Our faith accepts a logical, reasonable conclusion that design implies a designer. A lot more to be said about that for sure. But that's what faith is. Faith is though, are those four things. It is a, a faith that realizes that God is the one who, who promises stuff. So my attitude is I believe that. It, I may not have it yet. Everything that he said is not here yet, but I believe that. And it's going to affect my actions because I have a conviction. It's going to now control me and govern me when I go forward in my life. I know that I'll have the, the approval and the pleasure of God in the midst of that, the sense of knowing that God is, can, is happy with me trusting him, and I'm going to take that, that step as well to accept stuff that God says and God has made just like he made the world. He can do it. There's no lack of that. And when we come back next week, here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at verses 4 to 40. At least we'll get started in them, and we'll look at the family of faith. We're not going to dig into that, but I'd like to leave you with two thoughts as we come to this table this morning. The first thought I want you to think about in this chapter here is that these people in this chapter 
were not included in this chapter because their record was unblemished, but because they were forgiven by God. Think of that. David is in here, and he sure is a man who was not unblemished. Abraham is a man who lies about his wife, tries to protect his own hide. Jacob doing the same thing. There is no list of uh, people who are pristine and perfect in this chapter. They are blemished like you and I. And what puts them in that family is because of the forgiveness of God in Christ. Those Old Testament saints are looking forward to what Christ is going to do. We've looked back and we've seen what he's done, but we're all being saved and forgiven and reconciled to God through Christ and Christ alone. So when you think about your life of faith, don't think that this is going to be a picture in Hebrews 11 of these people who are unblemished and who are just got it all together. They don't have it together. But they do have these characteristics and traits that describe true faith. And then finally, secondly, these individuals are mentioned in spite of the fact that they left task unfinished. <laughs> They're not mentioned because they finished every task, but because Christ has completed everything. It wasn't about how strong their faith was, how well they did at it in the end. It's ultimately because of where their faith is connected to, and that is Christ and Christ alone. We'll see these blemished people, these people who don't finish their races well sometimes, still right here in this chapter, because it's going to encourage you, and it's going to encourage me to endure, to take that exhortation at the end of chapter 10, saying you're not like those people who walk away from God. You're not those people who leave the church and, and, and forsake the truth. You're going to keep following Christ. Now, you're going to ultimately be looking unto Jesus, chapter 12. But in between, look at how you get that enduring faith that perseveres as it does. Well, let's pray.